Welcome to Justice Matters. I'm Denise George, Attorney General of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Justice Matters is a program aimed to inform, engage, and empower you with knowledge of Virgin Islands laws that affect our everyday lives and our entire community. We have insightful discussions with special guests on the laws and related topics so you can be empowered with knowledge about the issues and take action so you can make a difference in our community and be a part of the solution. Today's topic is sexual assaults, crimes, and punishment. Joining us to get into the details of the sexual assault crimes in our territory is our own Assistant Attorney General, Anna Scott, who is a prosecutor at the Virgin Islands Department of Justice with specialized experience in the prosecution of sexual assault, adult and child cases. Adult and child sexual assaults are reportedly among the most underreported crimes throughout the nation and in the Virgin Islands as well. But it, it is all too prevalent as well in our community. Let's talk more about what these crimes are and the punishments. Well, welcome to Justice Matters, Attorney Scott. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> yeah, I know that you've had quite a lot of experience in the prosecution of sexual um, sex crimes, mm -hmm. and and I just want you to give give an idea of, of your background with respect to that. I was an Air Force prosecutor for uh, six years on active duty. I still am in the Air Force Reserves, and mm -hmm. that's what I do um, when I go on to orders. Is I try court martials, often mm -hmm. um, often involving sex crimes. Um, and then I was a prosecutor in Bear County, which is in San Antonio, mm -hmm. one of the uh, a very large DA's office in San Antonio, Texas. And um, I worked in the um, special victims unit. So yes. I did sex crimes, anything to do with children and domestic violence. Okay. And that's in speaking of which children, um, that you include the sex crimes against children as well. Absolutely. As part of your prosecutions. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, in the Virgin Islands, and how long have you been here? Just let the audience know. <laughs> sure. I uh, moved here in September 2019, um, and I have been with the Office uh, of the Attorney General since um, February of 2020. Okay, well, take a look. Taking a look at the local sexual assault crimes, um, give me a, give us an idea of what those crimes are, first of all. Sure. Um, so sexual assault in the, in the, the Virgin Islands is... There's several different crimes that are fall under that category. Mm -hmm. um, we have aggravated rape in the first and second degree, um, rape in the first and second mm -hmm. degree, and third degree, and then unlawful sexual contact, which also falls under the kind of umbrella of sexual assault in both the first and second degree. Okay, well, are we going to talk about the differences and what the elements are and in, in what, what they mean? So first right. of all, why don't we start with what? I um, want to start with the rape. Sure. Right. Aggravated rape. Um, mm -hmm. The the aggravated nature of the rape, the, the way that it's kind of classified under the, the law in the Virgin Islands is um, a lot to do with the, the person's age. The If it's a if it's a minor involved mm -hmm. um, who is the victim, typically it's going to be an aggravated offense of rape. Mm -hmm. um, so aggravated rape in the first degree is for children under the age of 13. Um, if the child, if the victim is under the age of 13 years old, um, it can also be if there is a injury or a deadly weapon used in, mm -hmm. in the rape. So that's aggravated rape in the first degree. Okay. So then what is just rape? What's the definition of rape? What does that mean? Rape under Virgin Islands law isn't, um, specifically defined, um, aside from the, how it is defined within each statute. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's sexual intercourse or sodomy is is the sexual act that has mm -hmm. to have occurred in order for it to be a rape. And then the the other factors kind of change the the degree of the rape. Okay. So it is that sexual intercourse or sodomy. That's right. Without consent. Right? Absolutely. Right. So it's right. without consent. So the consent issue is really the that at the integral part in the case of the adults. In the case of the adults. But again, if we're talking about a minor, it's not actually it's a factor. Not. Right. Exactly. So what is then impacted by that? What penalties are impacted by the age of the victim with respect to, let's say, aggravated rape? 
right. with the penalties. So aggravated rape in the first degree is um, 15 years to life. So the, the, the minimum that a person is going to get if they're convicted of aggravated rape in the first degree is 15 years. And then the, the ceiling is, is life. So there really isn't a ceiling. Um, and then if it's aggravated rape in the second degree, which is if the child is um, under the age of 18, then it's 10 years to life. So the aggravated offense is really, you know, the, the lowest you're talking about is 10 years. That's that's the beginning point. And then it goes all the way up to 10 life. 10 years to life, meaning 10 years is the minimum amount. That's right. Amount, or that's is a right. minimum mandatory, is that correct? Right. Yes. Absolutely. And then to life. So when mm -hmm. you say under 18, then, then you're saying between 13 and 18. Right. Is that it? Right. And then under 13, then that's when you have the mandatory is minimum is 15, is 15 years right. and then maximum to life. Right. OK, so aggravated rape in the first degree. So then what's next? So then there's rape in the first degree without mm -hmm. the aggravated mm -hmm. portion of it. And that again, um, that range of punishment is 10 to 30 years. So again, there's a there's a basement and here there's actually more of a, a ceiling mm -hmm. in terms of the 30 years. So um so what's the range? So what is rape then? Um, the definition of the rape in the, in the first, first degree. degree. So it's the same sexual intercourse or sodomy. Mm -hmm. However, there's a there are actually several different ways that that crime can be uh, perpetrated um, based on the the facts of the the circumstances of the actual assault. So mm -hmm. um, it can be because the person is incapable of consenting; they're unconscious. If somebody has sexual intercourse or performs sodomy on them in that circumstance, that would be a first degree rape. Um, it can be if their resistance is forcibly overcome. So mm -hmm. if they're forced to do um, these acts mm -hmm. um, or if they are put in fear of immediate or great bodily harm. So mm -hmm. if they're threatened, essentially, either, you know, with or if there's a weapon, takes it up to the aggravated, right? Mm -hmm. But if there isn't a weapon, they're just threatened, then that's rape. So there's, there are um, a total of six different ways, essentially, mm -hmm. that rape can be committed in um, a the first degree category. Okay. Now, one of them is, um, as far as the coercion mm -hmm. or under threat, well, how can you describe what is meant by coercion? Um, so coercion isn't actually in the statute anywhere, but there's different ways to coerce. So fraud can be one of them, mm -hmm. right? So, um, if, if you somehow trick somebody, make them believe they're somebody that you're, you're somebody that you're not, um, mm -hmm. something along those lines, um, or if the person is unconscious or something like that, but really coercion, um, in the first degree rape sense is, is, um, there's not an actual definition for it. It's, it's more, um, when you're talking about, um, aggravated rape in the first degree or aggravated rape in the second degree, then if it's a personal relationship and you're using some sort of influence of, you know, being a parent, a teacher, a counselor, a camp counselor, a police officer, then that kind of coercion is takes it up into the aggravated range if it's a minor um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, creates, you know, the, the offense, even if there isn't physical force, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's using your position, your power, your, your authority over somebody mm -hmm. to get them to engage into, in sexual acts that they wouldn't otherwise um, engage in. Okay, and that what that you refer to uh, is, as far as the coercion because of the position of authority, right. um, the way, what is that? Is that the rape in the second degree? or So it depends on the age again. Okay. So um, in aggravated rape in the first degree, um, if, if it's a person who is 16 years old, it could still be first degree aggravated rape mm -hmm. if that element of coercion is there, the, mm -hmm. the person of authority over them. Mm -hmm. If it's... Um, if that's something that happens um, with uh, an older child, it then or with a, an adult, um, we actually don't have a statute that perfectly captures that. Mm -hmm. It's it has to be a minor. So then, what are in first degree rape with respect to first degree rape? Mm -hmm. What are the types of um, situations that create that? You mentioned the force. You mentioned I right. think you said there were six. Yes. So that would then be force. And There's Incapable of being of consenting, so the person cannot offer resistance. They're unconscious. 
or they can be so incapacitated. That's if you're drugging somebody too. Um, we do have a specific um, subsection also, which says that if we know that they were given an intoxicant, right? Mm -hmm. So that they, you know, a narcotic or some kind of something that knocks them out, like a, a you know, roofie is they're co right. commonly called. Um, that's also another way. So, so the, the really you're talking about there is that they're incapable of consent and it can be under intoxication. That's where you sometimes you hear about the the drugs, like you said, right. the roofies or someone even um, just being slips something in there and they're just totally out or it's somebody right. just it's voluntarily drunk. That's right. Um, and then there's also forcible rape, um, which is first degree um, intimidation, fraud um, or unconscious. So we actually have two separate sections for incapable of consent and unconscious. But mm -hmm. you can imagine that some of those situations mm -hmm. could one situation could fall in both categories. Yes. So. Then we have the the sexual intercourse or the sex crimes against children right. um, that includes they is that included under first degree or is that just the aggravated um rape How is it, it actually falls under um rape in the second degree when mm -hmm. you're talking about a child who is um 16 years to 18 years so if you're if you're in that window then we're at second degree rape if they're younger than 16 then we are in aggravated territory mm -hmm. right so that 16 year old age is kind of where it pushes it up to aggravated if they're under that 16 years if they're old. under yeah and it, also uh, ag aggravated in first degree under 13 that's right 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 okay. so okay. it just changes the degree depending on the age under 16. Okay. what it, it's, it's so compare with respect to the punishments that that a person can face um between the aggravated rapes and the uh the rape in right. the first degree Right. Just so generally. it varies. It varies a lot. So if, if it's a child who for is between 16 and 18, which is is a child, mm -hmm. um, rape in the second degree is zero to 10 years. So the most that they could get would be 10 years or or no mm -hmm. um, jail time. That's the maximum. Ma right. Maximum. So it's zero to 10. Right. Okay. That's right. Um, but with rape in the first degree, it's 10 to 30 years again. So there's a cap. Mm -hmm. But with both of the aggravated charges, aggravated mm -hmm. rape in the first and second degree, there is no ceiling. There is no cap. Both of the those go up to life imprisonment. Mm -hmm. the, the statute may not actually say consent, but when you when it, you look at it, it really is talking about consent. So even when you talk about the six, and I want to um, go down a few of them when you say incapable of consent um, because a person does not... Um, is not able to offer resistance. Right. And so when you talk about that resistance, say, well, the person didn't resist. The person did not do that. That does not mean that consent was granted, right? Right. So, right. so in coupling that with consent, how, how do you determine the issue of consent based on those particular circumstances? Um, so uh, it is very, very fact specific at mm -hmm. the end of the day. Um, it's what kind of what was going on at the time, what, what nonverbal um, cues, you don't have to scream out, stop right now. Mm -hmm. You know, that isn't a requirement under the law. Mm -hmm. You, if, it, if you're, if there are no indicators that you should be moving forward with the mm -hmm. sexual act, then, you know, there, there is the possibility that it could be a sexual offense. Mm -hmm. Again, it's very, very fact specific. If the person is just laying there and not moving, mm -hmm. Our, our common sense would tell us stop, right? So maybe that isn't, there isn't consent, if the, but it, it just depends on the facts of the case. So it could be coercive if without saying something, you're still threatening them. There's a lot of different circumstances that could, could be coercive without, um, and, and that takes the, the element of consent and, and makes it um, a big issue. Or even at the, um, with respect to the resistance is prevented by an intoxicating or nar narcotic right. um, or liquor. That even talks about, well, the consent can't be granted because of the right. liquor. So, so it's really determined, it's, as you said, by what is going right. on. If the person the is throwing up right before you're, you're attempting to engage them in a sexual act. If they've, if you've had to pull the car, you're driving over it multiple times mm -hmm. to let them throw up. If they're not able to stand, if they're falling down and then you, you know, push a sex act onto mm -hmm. them, you know, the, 
the um, the circumstances matter. Mm -hmm. you, there is an expectation that as human beings, we can we can see when another person is incapable of, of functioning at a level where they can consent to sexual conduct. Mm -hmm. Nobody's saying that there has to be a waiver or something signed. It just, there is a, a basic understanding between humans that we, we expect mm -hmm. under the law where if you see somebody who is not able to function, mm -hmm. they as a human being walking down the street, let alone, they, then they certainly can't be expected to consent to sex. And then as far as children are concerned, once again, consent is not an issue. Right. So um, we do have a, a three-year, um, often referred to as Romeo Juliet law, where if, you know, if it's a 16-year-old and a 19-year-old, um, that that that's not an offense under the law mm -hmm. but children under um 16 and 18 puts them in different categories but they're they're children mm -hmm. and they they can't they do not have the capacity according to the laws in not just the virgin islands but every jurisdiction exactly. i've exactly. practiced <laughs> and um and in in most parts of the world they're they're not deemed to be old enough developed enough to mm -hmm. consent to sexual activity and so an adult having sex with a, a, a minor is, is illegal. But what about unlawful sexual contact? As you indicated, rape deals with the um, intercourse and sodomy and that sort of sexual right. um, contact. What about unlawful sexual contact? Tell us about what that is. Sure. So unlawful sexual contact has more to do with touching, right? It just is some kind of sexual touching. They, under the law, it says sexual mm -hmm. contact, but it's touching of a body part, and there's a list of body parts mm -hmm. that um, that it's essentially you cannot touch on a on a minor, right? Mm -hmm. Without a, at all in a sexual manner, there is a requirement that it be sexual in nature, right? So it excludes doctors who are performing exams, parents who are applying medication, things like that. But outside of that, there are certain body parts that you just, you don't mm -hmm. touch um, mm -hmm. on a child without um, a medical reason to. Mm -hmm. And then unlawful sexual contact doesn't only apply to children. No, right? so, it doesn't. Um, so how does that apply to adults? Um, it also applies to adults in situations um, where it's without consent again. So mm -hmm. with children, they can't consent to mm -hmm. that kind of touching at all. Mm -hmm. But with adults, if, if it's done without their consent, if they're somebody walks up to a person and grabs them, or even if it's in, you know, a, an intimate setting, but they didn't want that contact, um, that, that is a unlawful sexual contact as well. Okay. And uh, what are the offenses, the unlawful sexual contact offenses and the punishments associated with them? Sure. Um, unlawful sexual contact, uh, in the first degree and in the second degree. So there, there's two different, um, types of unlawful sexual contact in the second degree is um, zero to one year. So it's, um, and that's any touching of a, a victim who is over 13 years old and under 16 years of age. Um, and the defendant is over 18 years old. Unlawful sexual contact in the first degree is zero to 15 years. So um, a, a little bit, wider range of punishment there, but that can be against an adult um, or a minor, um, but the range of punishment is greater. Give more details on unlawful sexual contact in the first degree. What does that entail? So in, similar to rape in the first degree, there's kind of a list of possible ways that this crime can be committed. Mm -hmm. So one is by force or coercion. Um, another is that the victim is under 13 years of old age. So again, they can't consent to that kind of touching. Another is the victim is under 16 years of age and residing in the same household as the defendant and the defendant uses his or her position of authority to engage in the touching. So parent, counselor, teacher, that kind of thing, police officer. Um, the other two are um, threat. Again, threat placed in fear of, of bodily harm um, or uh, ability to consent is impaired um, by a intoxicant, narcotic, um, something like that. So again, they aren't able to stop it from happening. So certain uh, body parts, as you said, is involved in that. And that is um, through clothing or, or not. Can this occur? Both. Um, that's mm -hmm. right. So it can be... Um, 
under the clothing or on top of the clothing. It, it does not matter. It's not distinguished under the law. And now all of these sexual assault crimes in the Virgin Islands, they're all felonies, correct? Yes. And there are no misdemeanors. Or, or, or when we say felonies, we're talking about over with uh, where a person would face imprisonment of over one year. Unlawful sexual contact in the second degree is zero to one years. So, oh, that is right. A so that could then. be a, a misdemeanor. Right. And again, right. that's only if the, the it's a child between thirteen and sixteen years old, and uh, or and and the defendant is over eighteen years of age. Mm -hmm. What have you found with respect to the prosecution of these types of cases um, regarding uh, reporting, and and how that affects the prosecutions? Um. And it's not it's not just in the Virgin Islands, but it, it definitely um, I've seen it here as well, is that one is it's hard to know what we don't know. So mm -hmm. we don't know what of these offenses aren't being reported. Mm -hmm. um, the cases that are reported often are reported by a family member, a parent, an adult who finds out about something going on. Um, and it's it's very, very difficult on a child who comes forward with something like this. And a lot of times, even when it is reported, they still won't admit that it happened. Mm -hmm. And we have evidence of it through other means, but um, the the toll it takes on them psychologically is, is catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, they're now, not only have they been violated sexually, they're also having to deal with the fact that a person is going to jail and or being arrested or going through this process. Mm -hmm. And and so reporting is not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that a, a lot of people want to go through. Oh, nobody wants to go through it. And a lot of people just won't put themselves mm -hmm. through that. And parents think about that when they're thinking about reporting on behalf of their child. Is it what what are what's the next six months to three years of our life going to look like mm -hmm. once we make this report? So that that often happens, but at the same time, also we're talking about children, right? But it's also underreported with respect to adults as well. Yes, um, absolutely. And and wh what what do you see as the impact of that at all? If there is with adults, with adults reporting under underreporting, I mean, it, it just makes it makes moving all the way forward to where we're actually holding somebody accountable. Mm -hmm just endlessly difficult. Um, and, and a lot of that, you know, we've had a, I've had a lot of brave men and women that I've worked with in these kinds of cases who have seen it through to the end. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of people, even after they report, withdraw from the prosecution process. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, once you report a, a sex crime, um, it, it feels like everybody knows and it feels like everybody's talking about you. I've heard that over and over again, mm -hmm. that, you know, your personal business is suddenly just laid bare for everyone. And that, mm -hmm. especially in a small community, is so hard. Uh, it makes the idea of testifying, sitting in front of a jury, just Sometimes unfathomable. Yeah. What and um, there are laws though regarding that we have to follow, um, right? And um, regarding disclosing the names of sexual assault victims, right? And what is that? So we we especially minors, minors, their names don't even appear in in filing documents. Um, so we don't provide that information to anyone. We work really, really hard to protect the victims, adult and minors, mm -hmm. so that when they go through this process, they have anonymity, that they can, mm -hmm. you know, get through the process and safely and securely. There's um, resources to help with relocation and, um, you know, funding for um, finding a new house or, you know, getting mm -hmm. out of your lease so that you can move to somewhere safer. There's There are a lot of options that if you come forward, we can help provide and, and some degree of protection, get you to a safe place. Mm -hmm. Right. Because right. even as our, our laws are with respect, not just to minors, but it also pre prohibits the disclosure of the names of sex assault right. victims, even if they are adults. Right. Um, and even in investigations yep. to, to even um, disclose any information with respect right. to, to the identity of the victim. And that, that, 
those laws are to help, to right. help in making it more comfortable, if you could say that, right. with respect to coming forward, that you and don't safer. have to face. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, what about the statute of limitations? And uh, first of all, what is the statute of limitations? So on rape and sexual assault, there is no mm -hmm. um, statute of limitations. So um, it doesn't matter how long ago something happened. Um, a lot of people take a long time to process what happened to them. They may not have initially, um, I don't want to say strength because it doesn't mean they're not strong, that they don't mm -hmm. come forward. They just may not have the resources or an opportunity to come forward mm -hmm. when something first happens. But because there's no statute of limitations, you can come forward later and, and we can still investigate and potentially prosecute. And that's for both sexual assault cases um, as well as child abuse cases, Absolutely. whether it's child sexual abuse or otherwise. So just to be clear, statute of limitations deals with every single crime. There's with, there's a time period within which um, the prosecutors, prosecutors can bring a charge against someone. But with respect to sexual assault cases, as well as um, child abuse cases, there is none. So it can be 10 years later, 15, 20 years later, right. um, that a person can actually come forward. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that it, with respect to those types of situations, that that um, is helpful or impactful in any way with respect to giving some kind of uh, comfort towards victims coming forward? Yeah, I, I think a lot of um, people get a lot of closure and um, a, a sense of, you know, kind of retaking control over mm -hmm. a, a situation that was very much outside of their control when it was happening mm -hmm. by coming forward and uh, kind of taking control of the process. They, they you know, can regain that that sense of control. They can get some closure from it. Um, it it's uh, I think it's valuable um, for for survivors to come forward and and speak out about what happened, and also you know just because a case is older doesn't mean that it's not something that we can't investigate. Mm -hmm. And if there's other women who that has or men who that has happened to from that mm -hmm. same perpetrator, you know that may give them the strength to come forward as well. So what would you say um, if there's one thing that you would say? to persons um, with respect to either uh, victims of sexual assault, um, adult or child victims, or even parents of child victims? What would you say from a law enforcement prosecution standpoint um, to the public out there? Going through the process may be healing, um, but we're here. We're, 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 we're willing to work and work with you for, you know, if, if, you, if now is the time for you to come forward you know, please do it. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Justice Matters, Attorney thank you. And thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Justice Matters.